It's been a uh, fantastic evening. We've been, the chat has been the most active that I've ever seen it, which I'm very grateful for. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. It really means a lot. <gasps> yes! I did it! I did it, boys! I did it, boys! I felt delighted, privileged, and just a tiny bit terrified when I received an email from Battlefield the other week which granted me access to the closed alpha for Battlefield 1. I've spent hours over the last week playtesting the game to see whether this small slice of the game has what it takes to live up to its predecessors, and this video is the catalogue of all my thoughts I've accumulated during that playtime. We'll start with the weapons. It's hard to get a grasp on weapons because they all came in different variants. There wasn't any traditional customization, although that is coming in the final release, it just wasn't ready in time for this alpha. What I will say though is that you can say goodbye to generic gun syndrome that we had in Battlefield 4 because every weapon in this alpha felt unique in its own little way, not just by its design but also by how it handled. So instead of talking about weapons specifically, I'll talk more generically about them when referring to the classes. The main thing that struck me with the classes in Battlefield 1 is just how defined they are. The assault class is intended for getting up close and personal with vehicles and light infantry. If you try taking on an enemy at even medium range with the SMGs, you're going to struggle to compete with them if they're running a separate class. They absolutely dominate up close though. The medic has access to these semi-automatic rifles which are fantastic at medium range, or at least they were with the scopes that were provided by the preset weapon loadouts. The support class is deadly at medium to longer ranges with the LMGs that get more accurate the longer you hold the trigger. And finally, the scout class is lethal at long ranges with the bolt action rifles being capable of one shot killing enemies that are their sweet spot distance away as this sweet spot varies from rifle to rifle. This defined range for each of the class weapons means it encourages the player to stick to those ranges and contribute to the team effort more effectively, as all of the gadgets for each class complement the defined range of the weapon. The anti-tank grenade is great at taking out tanks in close quarters, the spotting flare is great for spotting enemies in a location close by to teammates, even though that you might be far away. It all contributes to that PTFO drive. The minimap is now a lot smaller than it has been in previous games, meaning that you're likely to be a lot less reliant on it. It's less about keeping one eye on the minimap and one about using the audio and visual cues provided to you in-game, and there are many. Spotting is a lot less accessible, shall we say, than it was in Battlefield 4 and Hardline. You can no longer spam Q 90% of the time to light up the screen with little orange Doritos. Rest in peace, by the way, little Dorito, you shall be missed. Instead, you have to be looking directly at an enemy when spotting for them to be highlighted with a tag in-game and on the minimap. There's also the flare gadget for the scout which marks nearby enemies, but the overall effect that these changes have had mean that it's much less likely for an approaching enemy to be spotted for you, putting more emphasis on your own personal reaction time and game sense. There's been a little bit of tweaking in terms of how scoring works. I'm going to go over conquest in a separate video, but the general consensus now is this. It's now required to PTFO in order to rank higher on the leaderboard. Going for kills won't net you anywhere near as many points as going for those objectives will, which is what makes it all the more important to work with your team to PTFO. There's bonus points available for capturing objectives with your teammates. So I really do have to tip my hat to dice here. The scoring heavily favours team and objective work, which I think, or rather hope, is going to work wonders for encouraging the player base to play the game how it's meant to be played, especially since a lot of the other shooter audiences have taken an impressive amount of interest in this title since its announcement. You know which one I'm talking about. Stereotype jokes aside though, this change is one of my most favourite changes that I've seen in the game so far. The map that we got to play in the alpha was St. Quentin's Scar that we saw in the reveal event at E3 last month, and I have to say that actually getting to play on it myself was incredibly pleasing. I think we could be about to see DICE flexing their muscles here when it comes to map design because they really did nail it here. The size of the map is perfect. It's not so large that you feel as though you're spending 80% of your time running between objectives, and yet it's not so small that it feels as though you're constantly being swarmed by enemies. It hits the very fine sweet spot in that regard. What also struck me is how diverse it is. You've got a capture point at a windmill, and in an urban area, in a destroyed street, in amidst some basic trenches, and all of those objectives feel unique and require a different play style to try and capture. A vehicle might not always be a great choice to capture an objective due to the amount of surrounding buildings that infantry could be hiding in. The objective in the monastery isn't even accessible by vehicles, so the map as a whole provides a nice balance of diverse gameplay that really is genuinely fun to partake in. Destruction is a big part of Battlefield games, and it's something that's been somewhat lacking in the recent titles like Hardline and you could argue Battlefield 4 as well. 
Whilst I mostly love what the game has to offer in terms of destruction, I also think that a few changes need to be made just to make it that little bit better before release. Don't get me wrong, the destruction is incredible here. Pretty much everything you would expect to be destroyed can be destroyed, and it all gives the map a sense of progression. When that camera zooms out at the end and you can see for yourself just how much the map has been levelled, with buildings destroyed and massive craters being made in the surrounding fields. It's quite a spectacle to behold, to be honest. But what I like to see changed is how this destruction can be triggered. A tank shell can take out buildings and create massive craters, and yet an anti-tank grenade isn't capable of even scratching a brick wall. I found this to be quite infuriating whilst playing, because I find it hard to believe that a grenade capable of dealing substantial damage to a tank isn't capable of blowing through a thin brick wall. Now let's talk about balancing for a bit here, just some very, very specific nitpicky things that I found to be quite infuriating. The tripwire bombs, they've been the bane of my existence during my playtime with this game. The wires, I don't know if it's just me, are very difficult to spot. It could be due to the way that the lighting works when travelling from outside to inside, or it could just be that they aren't large or long enough, but especially in close quarters areas, they are deadly, and they have killed me more times than I would like to admit. You can actually get two of these when you deploy, so there's a fair amount of firepower there. You could easily rig almost all of the houses in the Domination map if you have enough support players on the team. If they were to be nerfed before the final release, I would like to see a damage reduction just so that it isn't a full one-hit kill. Maybe it does 80 damage so it kills any injured soldier, but not a full health one. I'd like to see how this complaint fares in a more filled out version of the game, because there are more gadgets coming to the support class, meaning that in the full game, the issue is likely to be a lot less prevalent. Not everybody's going to be running with these tripwires. I still think that the damage nerf should be considered, however, as instantly killing a full health soldier is not something that I think should be possible. I also have a couple of issues with the gas grenades. One, there's no way to tell if gas is friendly or foe, other than to run into it and see if it harms you, and two, they are essentially flawed in terms of balance when you compare it to the incendiary grenade. Grenade. They both do the same damage, yet all players have a counter to the gas grenade with a gas mask, whereas no one has a counter to the incendiary grenade. So I think that either gas masks need to be made an equipable gadget that take up an inventory slot, or the damage models need to be changed slightly so it isn't trumped in every way by the incendiary grenade. A quick word on optimization, especially on the PC side of things. I was actually in the position during this alpha to go through a PC upgrade. I went from running a GTX 980 and an AMD FX 8350 processor, and I upgraded to an i7-6700K processor. Now, with my old AMD processor, I was able to get a roughly 40 to 50 frames per second on full ultra settings. Now, when I upgraded to my i7-6700K, that doubled to 80 to 90 frames per second, so I'm wondering if there's going to be some optimization improvements for AMD processors, although I went back to Battlefield 4 and did some testing and my frame rate still doubled with the i7, so if you have a weaker processor then I think that might be a limiting factor or a bottleneck for you in this game, but take that with a massive pinch of salt because again, this is just an alpha and further optimizations probably will be made before the final release. I've skipped over vehicles completely in this video because I am not myself a vehicle player and I genuinely wouldn't know where to start in assessing them, so so rather than impart a misinformed opinion, I decided to just leave them out and leave that section to the vehicle veterans out there. There's so much more that I haven't actually touched on, including the dynamic weather effects and the behemoths, but I currently have another seven videos planned on Battlefield 1 coming over the next few weeks, so make sure you subscribe to my channel to ensure that you don't miss out on anything else I have to say about my experience with the alpha. I want to take this moment to sincerely thank whoever decided I should get an invite to this alpha, because it really has been a privilege to help test this game in its infancy. I hope all of the feedback provided will go into creating what is shaping up to be one of the best shooters we have had in a long while. And I say this cautiously because remember this is an alpha, not even a beta. There's still a way to go before launch and I'm holding out on a final opinion until I see the final product. But for now, this early impression paired with the early version of the game is enough to get me very, very excited indeed. And that's all I have to say on the matter for now. If you enjoyed or you want to leave your own opinion down below in the comments, please feel free to do so. And don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more Battlefield videos like this, and I shall catch you in the next one.